I'm still, this, this whole thing is, <laughs> feels so weird. Hi, I'm the Digital Mermaid, and I just finished my Victron training, and very kindly, we have Lance with Victron, who's offered to answer some of your questions. Hello, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Thanks for coming out to the training. It was fun. Excellent. <laughs> so, Gordon Y. and others asked variations on the question, what does salt water do to Victron? And the salt air. What do you do to protect your equipment in marine environments? So we do have, in essence, like a lacquer finish over top of our um, uh, PCB boards. Conformal um, coating? Pardon? A yes, conformal coating? Thank you. Very, yes. I'm not being the techie guy. That no, I, <laughs> it is a conformal coating over it. Um, and then we do make uh, certain devices that are IP uh, listed. So we start off in basically an IP 2.0, which is 2 is this, dust and zero is the water um, and then we get up to an IP67 devices so which is basically our devices that can actually work underwater like our um, battery charger some of our battery chargers um, but generally speaking no they're dry environment products uh, you don't want to uh, they're not designed to go underwater they're electrical um, but uh, they are designed for the marine uh, marine industry and uh, provided you're using proper lugs and wire then you shouldn't have any tr issues with that um, they've been in service in the marine industry a long time so uh, you want to keep it obviously dry and try to reduce as much salt as you can in it um, and I always on smaller boats prefer it not to see in the engine room because you usually get mist and water dust in there okay um, one of the one of the big parts with Victron is that they're pretty much the premium quality. So, especially a lot of the viewers in our yep. channel is DIY. They might be wondering sometimes, you know, I can get these components relatively inexpensive from vendor X. I don't really care because the marine environment kills everything anyway. How often, or how long do you find in a typical? Um, private sailors boat do you find Victron gear lasts before it dies uh, I know that's past, a very loaded question uh, we offer up to a 10-year warranty so we're we're pretty confident that our stuff will last at least that long uh, we still have gear that's in, been in the marine environment for over 35 years so uh, that's still operating um, so uh, even as a DIYer um, no, it's not. A lot of these things aren't waterproof, but they are designed to be in that atmosphere. Um, you do have to take some protection. Um, we're not going to say that things aren't going to corrode because they are, but that is uh, everything on your boat's going to be corroding. Uh, so that's something that you would have to look after regularly anyway. So checking battery terminals and making sure that uh, um, you haven't mounted some devices where there's a lot of moisture. Dielectric grease works really well too, so. Excellent, thank you. Heiner Schmitz, I hope I pronounced your name right. Is it possible to connect two charges at the same time to increase charge speed? Do some Victron chargers, inverters, support this and others not? Almost all of our chargers and inverter chargers now support that. Um, all of our CAN bus systems now will, our VE CAN systems, they'll coordinate and synchronize their charging. Um, the inverters, when they're connected together, obviously do the same thing because they're acting as one unit. And now our smart chargers, um, once you set them up with VE smart networking, they'll also start to coordinate and synchronize their charging. So yes, you can take a couple of 30 amp um, IPP22 chargers and uh, make them communicate together on VE Smart and they will act as a single charger. So the answer to the question is yes. Almost all of our chargers except a few of the chargers such as this uh, Centaur and things like that that are basically designed as a standalone. Okay, so I'm certainly going to pronounce, your, pronounce this name wrong. I'm very sorry. PSJNL. How to charge with MultiPlus based on time? like low tariffs times. I know this came up in the training yesterday, but I want to elaborate on this a little bit to make sure that the frame of the question is clear. Um, in a lot of places, including where I'm from, say 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. can be twice the fee of 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Yes. So I know that there's an interest in people who are doing um, home batteries, Tesla Powerwall type, well, DIY Powerwalls, yes. 
where they want to run off the batteries from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., so long as there's charging the batteries, and then at 7 p.m. automatically turn on sure. the Quattro's line in one or the Multiplus or whatever yes. to charge up during the cheap, cheap time. So is that something you can so do? So a time shift, basically. Yes. Yes, um, you do need, you would have to have some sort of GX device, so a Venus device or um, the Servo um, color controller or something like that. And then in within the VE bus configuration, you can set up with an assistant, you can set up uh, a timing for the load, for the charger of the inverter to turn on and off so that you can prioritize certain times that it will work. Um, once again, you do need to have uh, a GX device uh, because that is what's going to be doing the timing. Um, preferably something that has Wi-Fi or internet access, so it's got a basis to do that timing. And then you will have to program it with the assistant. Um, so, and you can get to the assistants um, if you go to Victron Professional. Um, you can go in and we do have a whole uh, a video on uh, actually a training on uh, doing assistance with the VE bus system and then you can uh, set your timing and have the inverter charge during those times. You can also set within that you can also set it up so that if your batteries were getting low and you did need a charge that it can also work on a state of charge as well. So both ways. John Emmert asks, do they have better documentation on VE bus or CAN bus commands and registers? Um, expanding on that, does Victron have a developer's program that's yes. generally available? There is. You, um, you can get all that information off of the uh, website. Um, what you want to do is go to the search function and press in communication protocol and you're going to, about the first five things that come up on there are all the, will point you to all of those items that he's requesting. Um, after that, if that's still, if you're still looking to dig deeper, then I really suggest getting on to Victron Community and just put in what you want to do and you'll notice that there'll be several people, if not hundreds of people that have tried this already um, and are working with those programs uh, to develop their own systems. Does Victron have or plan to have a published API for any of your systems? A published API? Uh, where it's documented like okay, here this any product that supports API version X will support these types of queries and responses and whatnot. If you send this type of command, you'll get this type of response. Yes, there is our in fact it is already printed on one of the white papers um, where it gives you the protocols and then what the um, APIs are so that you can deal with them. Baso Balalaika, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, asked does Victron have an exchange program if customer wants to upgrade their systems to a more expensive version with larger current voltage or better features? And I think in general, that might be a question framed as, is there an exchange program at Victron? No, there isn't. Okay. There, there is no exchange program. Um, if you're looking at upgrading, um, if it's an older unit that uh, doesn't have the features that, are, that people are looking for today, um, we don't offer an exchange program. You may find that the dealer that is actually selling it might offer an exchange program, but Victron itself doesn't. Okay. Um, that is something that a dealer or distributor could offer, uh, but it's not something that uh, Victron Energy does offer. Building on that question, Victron does, though, have no problem supporting say, all the products that communicate with the VRM, for example. I know this came up in the training yesterday. If a unit is sold, to a third party, like, you know, I buy the, my Quattro and then down mm -hmm. the road I decide I want to switch to whatever. If I sell that, and you, I, you mentioned the example of I forgot to deregister it with my product, the new owner could reach out to you, prove that they've purchased it, and then you'll work with them to make sure that they can get access to that system. So Absolutely, yes. We're, we're, we're never going to leave a product alone. Um, we, we stand behind them for the five years. Um, well, we stand behind them for a lot longer than that, obviously. Um, but no, we, we, Victron's set up so that uh, any person that has one of our devices can get support from us, regardless of uh, whether they've purchased 
excuse me, purchased it through a third party, or if um, you have a friend and you want to upgrade and you've sold your friend your multi because you wanted a quattro, uh, we're going to support your friend as well. Or the example you gave yesterday, which I thought was great, is you sell your boat and all of the gear in it, or you buy a used boat and, it and all the gear in it, and the previous owner didn't deregister it, the new owner can work with you guys and you'll help them out in Absolutely. getting everything moved we over. Want, you've got, you, you've, you've inherited or, or purchased that equipment, um, be it somebody else might have installed it, um, you're still, you still want to use it. We still want to make sure that you're getting the full capacity out of it and, and, and happy with our product. So. On the Lake asks, I would like to know if there is the ability to add your own touchscreen to the Serbo GX. I would like to have a 15 or 20 inch screen I can see from a distance or with a security camera. Yes, yeah, so we did discuss this in the uh, training. Um, it has come up over and over again. Um, on the Serbo, uh, the touchscreen is an HDMI. You do not have to have our touchscreen. Um, it works very well. Um, it's a nice form factor, but if you do want to uh, extend that and have a larger screen, you can use another touch screen. Um, I personally have never done it. I have seen a few applications where they have. You would have to sort of test with it and make sure that the touch screen works properly. I've also uh, been told uh, by uh, one of our dealers that they've actually connected a computer screen to it and then use the mouse as the touch screen to as the pointer and actually operated the servo that way as well. So yes, you have that ability. I just had a thought that might be of interest to some of the viewers, again, DIYers. I could imagine, especially people doing cold climate sailing, you have your gloves on. If you had a um, trackball that you mounted set up to the screen so you, you don't have to worry about the touch. You, you could roll the trackball around roll the track and, ball and tap around. the trackball and then you'd be... And then uh, you could do it with like heavily gloved hands. Exactly, yes. Excellent. All right, so the last question was asked by a few people, but it's my own personal biggest question is grounding on a boat, especially grounding on a boat without a traditional motor where you've got a, an electric propulsion system. A lot of the documentation on grounding says tie everything back to the engine. Dude. There is no engine. Um, this ties into um, UHF radio grounding, lightning suppression. There's grounding is a huge topic, one that we can't really fill in this quick we, session. What resources and are we available? probably won't. And no. and grounding is something that we could probably talk about for hours. And I'm not an expert in grounding, um, but I do have. I I am ABYC. Um, certified and I've been in the marine industry for over 20 years now um, so we've done a lot of grounding uh, and bonding um, different things I, they are totally different things uh, it all comes back to something being connected to the engine typically um, or a, a negative bus bar uh, or in fact it would be the grounding bus bar um, even in an electric propulsion we're still looking for some way to mitigate uh, a galvanic uh, action and um, that uh, voltage difference. Um, so we do need to get the electrons out into the ocean. Um, a lot of times, uh, often now I think what you're going to find is people are putting ground plates on their boats when you're getting into electric propulsion so that you may be using the ground plate instead of your uh, battery negative or a combination of those uh, to give those electrons, um, be it from a lightning strike or from what have you, uh, out to your ground plane, which is basically the ocean. Um, it still doesn't stop you from grounding the electric motor to the propeller shaft and having that because you've got a whole bunch of dissimilar metals going on and you want to be able to zinc those to, or, for, or have some sort of cathodic protection to them. So it's still going to be important to have those items bonded and grounded when you're looking at your whole system. Um, the bonding issue combined with grounding is, is you could go on for days about that. Um, but generally speaking, if you're looking at a boat, um, ABYC has very specific standards of how they want things bonded and grounded. And following those, regardless of whether you have a diesel motor, a gas motor, or an electric motor, isn't really going to change that much. As far as the lightning strikes, um, 
for grounding and dissipating that. There, there are several different um, theories, um, and generally speaking, I would still use an ABYC standard. Um, a lot of um, a lot of businesses have written things about it and what they feel should be done, um, and done a lot of testing. You can also find a lot of information on grounding and that in our um, Wiring Unlimited. Uh, Marguerite goes through a, a whole chapter just on that. Which and of course, it's going to park, park out right, right out in front of us, which is fine, but... All right, continuing. Continue. <laughs> Here we go. Break. <laughs> Pause. Cut. <laughs> Big truck. Cut it. <laughs> truck. <laughs> So you were just starting to talk so, about the so um, energy. First of all, energy unlimited, which is 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 more about battery charging things like that. But the wiring unlimited, which is available through the technical um, publications from Victron, uh, we do devote a whole chapter to to grounding and grounds and grounding and the importance of those because of course you still have to make the boat safe you don't want somebody touching something and electrocuting themselves you definitely don't want um, to be discharging electricity into into the ocean through your uh, prop shaft through your prop shaft or what have you um, being it going into the ocean is actually a lot safer than when you get into brackish or fresh water which um, because uh, because the ocean salt water is a great electrolyte um, fresh water isn't but you as a person are an incredible electrolyte um, so that is that is a, a, a safety concern of, of making sure the grounds are, are done properly so that you're not pushing that power into into the water where the incorrect uh, power into the water where you can create a circuit with your body thank you very much how's that for a short answer on a long time Right dead on time. 11.30. Too.